The following video was taken from Ace Organic Chem Elite, full of movies, videos, flashcards, a test bank, and much, much more. Plans start at less than $20. Sign up today and get two free ebooks with your subscription. Cancel anytime, money back guarantee if not completely satisfied, and you keep the ebooks. Just click on the link in the video notes. And now, on to our video. In this video, we're going to talk about the Wittig reaction. And Wittig is spelled, right, some people call it a Wittig, but I, I think it's actually pronounced Wittig. What this reaction does is that you can take uh, a carbonyl. So here I show uh, an aldehyde on the top or a, a ketone on the bottom. And you can subject it to a phosphorus compound. In this case, we're going to uh, use the one I show here. And what this does in its very, very most basic form is you substitute whatever is on the end of this phosphorus ilid. And we'll talk about that in a second. You substitute that for the oxygen. So you make an alkene out of an aldehyde here. And we can do the same thing with this ketone down here. We'll, we'll change it up a little bit. Um, instead of that, how about this? Right, so we've got an ethyl group on the end there. And when this is all said and done, you do this reaction and you replace that with this. So in both cases, we've created an aldehyde. In the top case, it is a mono sub I'm sorry, an alkene. Uh, mono substituted alkene on the top, tri substituted alkene on the bottom. It's a really handy reaction for working with aldehydes and ketones, but we're going to dive into this thing. So the first thing we need to ask is, what the heck is that phosphorus reagent we're dealing with? And it's called an ilid, specifically in this case, a phosphorus ilid. And a phosphorus ilid is created kind of specifically. You take triphenylphosphine. That's that. So the pH is just uh, benzene rings or phenyl rings. Three phenyl rings attached to a phosphorus. That's triphenylphosphine. We will subject that to an alkyl halide. When we do this reaction, it's an SN2-like reaction. So phosphorus is the nucleophile. There's our leaving group making this carbon here, the electrophile. Phosphorus attacks, kicks off the leaving group. And, and I'm going to uh, draw out here what you get out of this. I, I think it's instructive. So you add triphenylphosphine. That triphenylphosphine has a positive charge on it. And then remember, we have X negative floating around. Okay? So, we have created this crazy looking compound here. What happens from here to form our ilid? We're close. We need to get rid of that hydrogen there. You do it with a really strong base. A lot of times people will use like butyl lithium or something because remember this hydrogen is bound to a carbon. Super super strong, right? That's a that's a the pKa on that is pretty high so it's going to be hard to rip off we need a strong base to rip that off when you rip that off remember base comes around abstracts the proton and it's going to kick in its electrons to form a double bond right here and quench the positive charge so that's really the driving force is the formation of this double bond what you get out of it is that And, and of course, you know, butane, we, we've got our, um, and then uh, lithium X, which is the salt, but those are all byproducts. We don't care about those things. What we care about is that you formed your ilid. Now, this has a resonance form, and that's what we care about. And the resonance form, 
looks like this. I'm going to scroll down just a hair. So the resonance form, if we readjust here, you can take the electrons from this double bond and plant them all on the carbon because phosphorus doesn't mind being negative or positive. I'm sorry. Phosphorus doesn't mind being positive. Carbon will take those electrons. This makes this carbon really, really nucleophilic. And this is where our reaction occurs. The definition of an illid is a 1-2 dipole. So it has a formal positive and a formal negative charge right next to each other. This is a phosphorus illid, and this is what allows us to do a Wittig reaction, just like we did above there. So now that we've we've hashed that out, let's let's look at the mechanism. So now that we know how to form a phosphorus illid, we have a phosphorus illid right here, and I've made it a symmetrical, a symmetric phosphorus illid with ethyl groups on both sides. Remember that carbon can hold a partial negative charge or a formal negative charge if you want to draw it that way. Now we're going to subject that to a ketone and see where this reaction goes. So let's add those two guys together. If we were to do this, remember, ketones, there is our electrophile. That carbon is very electrophilic. This carbon is very nucleophilic because of resonance in both cases. Think about your resonance when you're doing this. When we do this reaction, it's going to be uh, a reversible reaction because it, it can go back and forth. And what we're going to get out, uh, actually, I'll, I'll draw it. And, and I think it's instructive to draw it because you can see some geometries. So there's our triphenylphosphine. Oops, excuse me. Remember we had a negative charge on this carbon here. That will have attacked So let's draw, there we are. And, and what we've gotten out of it, here comes the crazy part. There it is. And of course, a positive charge on the phosphorus. This structure, and all I've done here is taken these electrons, transferred them over to the carbonyl, and then, I guess if we're going to be formal about this, remember those electrons kick up to the oxygen. That's how we get the negative charge up there. This is the intermediate that we get out. This intermediate is referred to as uh, a betaene. This is the first step of our Wittig reaction, the first intermediate. Now, what I'm seeing here is a negative oxygen near a really near a positive phosphorus. Phosphorus loves oxygen, like really loves oxygen, thinks it's the, the best. Phosphorus is considered an oxophile because of good orbital overlap. Phosphorus loves being bound to oxygen. And guess what? One happens to be negative and the other is positive right now. So Boom, we're going to close that loop. And what you get out is the new structure that looks like this. This structure, this intermediate, is referred to as an oxophosphatane. Oxophosphatane. Again, another intermediate in forming our alkene that we're eventually going to get out of this. This is the easy part now. You have a four-membered ring. This thing is going to fall apart because, again, phosphorus loves oxygen. You do a backwards 2 plus 2. 
And what we're going to get out of it is our alkene with the methyl groups on one side, the ethyl groups on the other. So let's draw those here. Ethyl groups on that side. Methyl groups on this side. In essence, we have taken, and I guess it's worth putting those methyl groups there too. We've taken this oxygen and replaced it with two ethyl groups, making a tetra-substituted alkene. And as our byproduct, triphenylphosphine oxide, which is kind of difficult to get rid of, but... You know, we're doing paper chemistry here. We don't care about that. In the laboratory, there's other ways to do this that are uh, a little easier to get rid of byproducts. But for paper chemistry, this works really well. So the Wittig reaction is, is really versatile and a nice way to form double bonds especially in difficult places. So let's take, and it, and it works for all, all types, on all types of ketones and aldehydes. So you could take, for example, cyclopentanone. And you could subject cyclopentanone to, you know, really whatever Wittig you wanted. Let's, let's do a simple one. Carbon, and then off of that carbon is... Uh, let's see, there'd be a hydrogen, and then let's make it CH2CH3. There we are. So we're adding one, two, three carbons to one side or another of this um, cyclopentanone, and what we're going to get out, all right, so there's the cyclopentane. We are forming a double bond. There's one carbon coming off at the top there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have carbon one, carbon two, and a third carbon. And then off the other side is just hydrogen. It's symmetric on the bottom, so we don't need to worry about cis-trans issues. But, but you can see here, pretty nice the way we did this. Now what's the retrosynthesis? Let's think about retrosynthesis for a second. So if you, there's my amazing retrosynthesis arrow, if you had this that you needed to get to in a synthesis problem and you needed to work backwards to see where this came from, draw your your dashed line right there so that's where you would sever the bond. One side is a Wittig, is a, is a phosphorylid. The other side of this is a ketone or an aldehyde, is a carbonyl. Which side you do it on depends on which is easier. So, so for example, we also could have had, let's, let's do this problem the other way now. So we could have had one, two, three carbons on the top, so we could have had a three carbon aldehyde. And we could have subjected that three carbon aldehyde to the phosphorylid of watch this. Oops. There we are. And the only reason I'm, I'm drawing it like this is because the program really doesn't like adding things to phosphorus. But we could do this. If we had this phosphorylid and we had this aldehyde do it backwards, we're going to get the same thing out. It's going to attack the same way. Right? The attack is going to come to there. Go there, we're going to do the betaine, we're going to do the oxyphosphatane, and we're going to get out the same product. 
So your retrosynthesis, when you break this up here, can go one of two ways. You put the carbonyl on one end, you put the phosphorylate on the other. Which side you put that on is you just decide which is easier to form based on what your professor allows your starting materials to be. So if you're only allowed to start with a three carbon something, then guess what? That's a pretty good one. Start with that aldehyde and add the five later. So something to think about. I want to show you one other thing. This is kind of cool. It's ring closing. If you want to close a really big ring. So let's start with here. We have this um, ortho substituted. Um, so, so there's uh, leaving groups on the benzyl positions of this ortho substituted phenyl ring. And X can be anything. Right, it can be chlorine, it could be bromine, um, probably not iodine or phosphorus, they're a little too labile, but it could be um, one of those special sulfonates, like a tosylate or something. Anyway, it's a leaving group. We subject it to triphenylphosphine, then butyl lithium. What we get out, we're, we're just going to replace, oops, excuse me, we lose a hydrogen. There we are. That looks better. So we've added, we've turned this into, I don't know, would you call it a diilid? I don't know. I mean, it's two triphenylphosphines on there. You can do that, and, and it makes sense, and it works. This reaction works. Now you have two phosphorus ilids that you can do two simultaneous Vitig reactions with. So let's do that. So now we need our victim. We need a couple of carbonyls to react with those two phosphorus ilids. Well, if we do this, here we have, again, this is a meta substitute, I'm sorry, an ortho substituted dialdehyde. Ditriphenylphosphine dialdehyde. We're still going to attack in both those positions. Kick up those guys. We are going to create two, all right, mind this, two alkenes. We're going to close the ring between these two. We're going to close a ring and create a ring between these two phenyl rings. How big is that ring going to be in the middle? Here's the easiest thing to do. Count your carbons. So let's start here. Carbon 1, carbon 2. Carbons 3 and 4. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and I've got the phosphorus attacking. It's not the phosphorus that attacks. That, that was a little, a little sloppy of me there. Um, you, you, actually, I very well might have lost credit for that on an exam. Right, it's the carbons that attack. Don't get sloppy with your mechanisms like I just did. Let's have those carbons attack. There we are. Much better. So the carbons attack one, two, three, four on part of the ring. And then here we're forming a double bond. Here we're forming a double bond. And on the other side of those double bonds is one, two, three, four carbons. So four on this side. We're adding four carbons in the ring on this side. We're going to create an eight-membered ring. In the middle. An eight membered ring with two phenyl groups on the end. There's the eight membered ring we created. There's the two double bonds we created. This looks really, really good. And, and what you get out of this is this really cool fused three membered ring system. Three membered ring fused system. Now, when you look at the retrosynthesis of this, again, you do not, you want to break bonds that are easy to, to make. There's the bonds that are easy to break and to make. You don't want to mess with these benzene rings off of here. Break those bonds. But, but hopefully you see what we did here. We can use a Wittig reaction to close rings. I think this is pretty slick, and if you get a really tough synthesis problem, keep this one in mind.